Thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some of the work from our team. We're focused on trying to understand the underlying causes of chronic pain. And an area that we're uh, particularly passionate about is on uh, improving the safety of o opioid medications. So a uh, question for everyone. Um, how many people think uh, a world uh, without pain would be ideal? That is, our goal should be to eliminate pain entirely. Yeah? A few hands, yeah? So it's a little bit of a trick question because there's different types of pain. And acute nociceptive pain, the type of pain that tells you that when you put your hand on a hot stove, that you should move your hand from that hot stove is protective. We need it. We need it to survive. It tells us, uh, informs us of potential injury to ourselves. We have very sophisticated fibers or nerves that tell us, um, that communicate that pain information, let's say from your hand, that information can be relayed to the spinal cord and then to the brain where you can perceive uh, where that pain is originating, the intensity, and it uh, triggers a response. And so often when we're thinking about getting rid of pain, we're, we're thinking about chronic pain. And that occurs when that system that communicates that pain information goes awry. So that uh, something that's normally not painful all of a sudden elicits a pain response. Or you can be sitting there and there's no stimulus and that system fires and so you get spontaneous pain. Chronic pain affects more people than diabetes, heart disease, or cancer combined. And in the United States, it's est estimated upwards around $635 billion per year, the cost of chronic pain. And in Canada, one in five Canadians are affected by chronic pain. That same number applies to Albertans as well. And the impact, direct and indirect, of chronic pain is about $60 billion per year. And that's not even um, uh, factoring in the emotional toll and impact that it has on the individual and their families and caregivers. And so one of the most powerful medications that we often use are opioids, and opioids act on that system that relays pain. And what it does is, is it blunts the way that information is conveyed. It actually blocks the release of some of those transmitters, those molecules that communicate painful information. And so opioids have been around for a long time. Uh, the ancient Egyptians and Greeks uh, knew that opium, which has naturally derived opioids, uh, contained naturally derived opioids, um, they referred to opium as the joy plant because you can get a high from it, um, it causes, uh, induces sleep, and also it relieves pain. But it wasn't until 1803 that Frederick Zertner uh, isolated the active component in opium and called it morphine after the god of dreams, Morpheus. And that opened the Pandora's box because uh, with that knowledge, we can then identify the structure, modify that structure. Now we have synthetic and semi-synthetic opioids that are even more powerful than the natural de derived uh, um, uh, uh, molecules like morphine. And opioids to this day account for uh, over 40% of chronic pain medications. And Canada is the high, second highest consumers of opioids. And so with this high, well, widespread use of opioids, um, pregnant uh, women are also uh, using this medication. And one of the consequences is that babies are born that are uh, dependent on opioids and they, dis and they go through withdrawal as well. So in the US, every 25 minutes, a baby is born uh, experiencing opioid withdrawal. Of course, when we're thinking about the opioid crisis, we're thinking about deaths. And, and, and opioids, what they do is they act on a very specific area of the brain, the brain stem that controls your breathing. And so what opioids do is it um, inhibits or suppresses the activity in, in, in that brain center that controls breathing. And so you stop breathing and uh, it causes death. So this is uh, a heat map. OK, so the heat map is moving. Um, so the more red uh, indicates the more number of opioid-related deaths. And so you can see from 1999 to, I think it goes to 2016, that the number of deaths 
have increased dramatically. And you can see the spread from just only a few areas to across the United States. So, so this uh, animation is very striking in terms of that spread of the opioid crisis. And in Canada, we're not immune to that problem. Um, in the past three years, we've had uh, over 11,000 deaths. In Alberta, uh, uh, last year, we had um, almost 800 opioid-related deaths. And a few things to note is that uh, the majority of these uh, opioid-related deaths are accidental. And they impact most prevalently, they can impact all age groups, but most uh, prevalent is uh, between 20 and 29 years of age. 92% uh, of them are accidental overdoses. Um, and the majority of these overdoses involve fentanyl. And so fentanyl is much more potent than uh, morphine. And a lot of them actually involve illicit uh, fentanyl. So one of the problems that my group is focused on is opioid withdrawal. And so what that is is when an individual tries to stop their opioid use or they try and limit or decrease the amount they use, they can experience opioid withdrawal. And what happens is that when you're on opioids for an extended period of time, your body uh, ad adapts to it. It develops a new balance or equilibrium. And so when you try and stop your opioids, it unmasks those changes and it manifests as withdrawal. And so one of the people often think that uh, only people who are uh, illicitly using opioids or who are abusing opioids um, become dependent and develop withdrawal. And in fact, that is not true. You could be using your opioids as needed, and when you try and stop, you, you could experience withdrawal. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't use opioids. In fact, opioids are very potent and very useful for managing acute post-operative pain. Some of the problems that are associated with opioids is when it, they're being used for an extended period of time. So often I get contacted by patients, um, and uh, one particular individual who's 62 years of age said that it was uh, very difficult for him to stop his opioid medications because of the withdrawal symptoms. Another individual indicated that they've tried every sort of program, but withdrawal kills any attempts at um, stopping their opioid use. And another individual compared it to the new cancer. So you can see the impact that it has on the individual. And I always make it a point to respond to uh, these questions. Unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of options available to appropriately manage opioid withdrawal. Um, a lot of the strategies involve um, taking the individual off their opioid and putting them on another opioid. Uh, but the, the other opioid that they're being put on has uh, different characteristics. It's more stable, it's longer lasting, but it's another opioid nonetheless. So the non-opioid options are like clonidine or leflexidine, and those medications affect how your nervous system functions normally, and so there's a lot of side effects. And so not surprisingly, there's a, lot of, there's a high dropout rate. Um, uh, less than 30% of uh, people actually are able to come off their opioids completely. And so there's a, a need to understand why withdrawal occurs and uh, new approaches for managing that, that problem. And so our team uh, recently discovered that opioids activate the immune system, in particular a very specific type of cells known as microglia. And so the microglia are immune cells that live only in the brain and the spinal cord. And we found, and, and we can watch how the immune cells function. And so the uh, green cells on the left, they're the immune cells in the spinal cord. And that's a time lapse, lapsed uh, uh, series of uh, images from those immune cells. And they're very active. They're constantly, all of us sitting here, have those immune cells sitting in their spinal cord and brain. And they're extending and retracting their processes. They're monitoring the environment around our nervous system, and they can respond to injury or drugs. And so opioids activate those immune cells. And we can isolate those immune cells and put them in, in essence, we have immune cells on, on a plate. And so that allows us to study what's going on in those cells. And so what we identified on those immune cells was a specific target known as Panexin-1 channels. And so this channel 
uh, opens and closes and in essence it allows those immune cells to communicate with other cells in our nervous system and when we block those channels uh, with drugs or genetically, we can alleviate uh, a lot of uh, those withdrawal uh, symptoms in our preclinical models. And as it turns out, when we were looking at, well, how could we translate this information, this new knowledge, uh, there is a drug out there known as um, probenicid, and that's an old class of medication or an old drug that was used to um, treat gout. And so it blocks those channels uh, quite effectively. And, and when we use that medication, we could alleviate a lot of the withdrawal uh, symptoms. And where we're heading with that knowledge now is we have two clinical trials. Uh, one is in collaboration, a phase one clinical trial with the Calgary Chronic Pain Center. And there we're testing to see how effective probenicid might be in alleviating withdrawal in a very specific group of patients. Um, those that are trying to taper, so reduce their opioid use, and we're seeing whether probenicid can help them reduce that uh, opioid dependence uh, much more rapidly. In a phase two clinical trial, which is much more bigger in scale, and we've partnered up with a, a pharmaceutical company, uh, we're testing this also on, on a, a bigger population of patients. And as it turns out also, in, uh, we, we identified that this target uh, if we block, we can alleviate uh, arthritis pain in uh, our preclinical models. And we're still trying to develop that right now. And we're trying to put together a clinical trial with our uh, veterinary, uh, veterinary colleagues. And so what is happening in Alberta? Well, um, there's actually a lot of effort and excitement uh, about trying to improve uh, uh, care as it relates to chronic pain. And so the Alberta Health Services, um, in collaboration with the Pain Society of Alberta, uh, has been working on a strategy known as the Alberta Pain Strategy. And just last weekend, we had a meeting at Lake Louise where we officially, they officially unrolled this pain strategy. And you'll notice that there are three areas of emphasis, acute pain, chronic pain, and also opioid use and pain management. And in uh, collaboration with them, what we're doing uh, is building an Alberta pain research network so that we can align pain research with health, improved healthcare delivery. And so uh, there's also a lot of efforts going on nationally with the Canadian Chronic Pain Task Force. And so there is a lot of attention and effort in trying to improve uh, pain management for patients. Thank you.